Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Manned Spacecraft Center. This is the Apollo 11 press conference. The format today will consist of a 45-minute presentation by the Apollo 11 crew, followed by question and answers. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Apollo 11 crew, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin. Neil? It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, but rather one that took place in the last decade. We all here and the people listening in today had the opportunity to share that adventure over its developing and unfolding in the past months and years. It's our privilege today to share with you some of the details of that final month of July that was certainly the highlight for the three of us of, of that decade. We're going to divert a little bit from the format of past press conferences and talk about the things that interested us most, in particular the, the uh, things that occurred on and about the moon. We will use a number of films and, and slides, which most of you have already seen, and with the intent of, of pointing out some of the things that we observed on the, the spot, which may not be obvious to, to those of you who are, who are uh, looking at them here from the sur surface of Earth. The, the flight, as you know, started promptly. And I think that was characteristic of, of all the events of the flight. The Saturn gave us one magnificent ride, both into Earth orbit and on a trajectory to the moon. Our, our memory uh, of that actually differs little from the reports that you have all heard from, the, from those previous Saturn V flights. And, and those, the, the previous flights served us well in preparation for this flight in, in the boost as well as the, the subsequent phases. I'll, we, we would like to, to skip directly to uh, the translunar coast phase and uh, remind uh, ourselves of, of the chain of events that long chain of events that actually permitted a landing, starting with the undockings, or the tr transposition and docking sequence. This was our first look at the magnificent machinery which had been behind us up until this point, the, uh, the booster. Of course, the first and the second stages had long since separated, but this shows the limb nestled inside the third stage, the S4B, after the translunar inject burn. This maneuver was an interesting combination of manual and automated techniques in that we programmed the onboard computer to make the turnaround, and then these final maneuvers were made uh, completely manually. As I approached the, uh, the LEM, I had an easy time because I had a docking target, which is not too clearly visible here, which allowed me to align the probe and the drogue, which is the dark spot you see on the upper right. 
During this time, I also checked out the proper vehicle response to the, uh, my stick inputs. And here shortly, you'll see the actual docking somewhat speeded up. There's the point of contact. And in just a second, you'll see a second uh, right there, a, a second small indication of the uh, retract cycle when the 12 docking latch is made. We made uh, two entries into the lunar module. This is our first view of the inside of this. Uh, the final activation was made on the day of power descent. On the two previous days, when we entered, we removed, <coughs> removed the probe and drogue and found that we had a rather long tunnel between the two vehicles. On uh, entering the uh, lunar module, one had to uh, do a slight flip maneuver or a half gainer to get into position for uh, the, the lunar module, of course, is uh, in a sense upside down relative to the uh, command module. This is in lunar orbit showing the uh, separation of the lunar module from the command module as, as viewed through my window. This was a busy time for me in that I was taking uh, these motion pictures through the right-hand window at the same time, I was taking still photos through the left-hand window and uh, also flying my vehicle and... <laughs> probably poorly and uh, taking uh, a close look at the limb as, as he turned around. Uh, my most important job here was to make sure that all his landing gear were, were down and properly locked prior to his descent and touchdown. This is uh, his yaw maneuver, and th the white dots you see are the landing gear pads. This gives you uh, a better idea of the detail available with the 70 millimeter. Of course, this is a still, and uh, shows the limb either right side up or upside down. I'm not sure which. Uh, it looks uh, more like, to me, it looks more like a praying mantis than it does a first-class flying machine in this view, but uh, it was a beautiful piece of machinery. The the uh, landing gear are at the top, and uh, you can see the probes which uh, indicate lunar contact as, as thin wires extending upward from the landing gear. Of course, before we could undock, as is shown in this uh, picture, we had to complete the activation. Now, the day before we undocked, uh, we entered the LEM and went through an entire switch configuration check, uh, and we exercised the various communication modes. Uh, in retrospect, since we did have a little bit of communication problems on the following day during power descent, we would uh, recommend that uh, we might make a more, more thorough check of this on the day before descent. Uh, on the day that uh, we did finally enter the LEM for the uh, landing maneuver, we uh, went through a staggered sequence of suiting, and we found that uh, with all the simulations that we had run back here in Houston, uh, or with Houston tied with our simulations in the Cape, that we were quite confident that we would be able to complete this uh, LEM activation in the given time period, which was approximately four hours. Uh, we managed to get uh, 30 minutes ahead of the time, and uh, it allowed us to get a more accurate uh, platform alignment check at one point. After the... Uh, undocking maneuver, we went through uh, a brief radar check, and then the command module uh, executed a two foot per second maneuver away from us so that we would both be able to independently uh, exercise our guidance system through a uh, star alignment check, which we did following this, uh, this separation maneuver. Now this occurred in a vicinity close to the landing site, and you can see at this point the command module is traveling right over the center of our targeted point. He's approaching now what we call the cat's paw. Following this uh, separation maneuver, on the back side of the moon, uh, we made a descent orbit insertion, which is a slightly over 70 foot per second maneuver that uh, lowers our altitude down to 50,000 feet. We had two guidance systems working for us, and they uh, behaved perfectly. Uh, both of them agreed extremely closely as to the results of this maneuver. Uh, following this, we used the radar to uh, confirm uh, the actual uh, departure rate from the command module. 
This is a view of the descent uh, trajectory area as viewed through the LAM window during our activation. In the bottom right of the uh, photograph is the crater Maskelin, and in the bottom center is the mountain called Boot Hill. Immediately above Boot Hill is a small sharp-rimmed crater called Maskelin W, which was the crater that we used to determine our downrange and crossrange position error prior to uh, completing the final phases of the descent. Uh, the landing area itself is in, uh, is in the smooth area at the top of the picture uh, just before we arrive at the shadow, or what's called the terminator. We had uh, seen a, a number of pictures from Apollos 8 and 10, which gave us an excellent understanding of the ground track over which we would pass during the descent. We're now looking out the right-hand window of the crater, and there's Maskelin W. Uh, it occurred approximate, approximately two to three seconds late and gave us the clue that we would probably land uh, somewhat long. After after completing those position checks, we rolled over face up so that the landing radar could uh, lock on the ground and confirm our actual altitude. Now, this picture doesn't show it, but at this phase in the trajectory, we were looking out directly at the planet Earth. In the final phases of uh, descent, after a number of program alarms, we looked at the landing area and found a very large crater just in the very left top corner of the picture. The, the camera is located in the right window and looks to the right and did just barely sees this boulder field we're passing over right now. We're at 400 feet and those boulders are about 10 feet across. This was the area which we decided we would not go into, extended the range downrange, and saw this crater which we passed over, this 80-foot crater, in the final phases of descent and later took some pictures of. Now you can see the exhaust being, uh, the, the exhaust dust being kicked up by the, by the engine and uh, this was uh, some concern in that it degraded our ability to determine not only our altitude and altitude rate in the final phases but also and probably more importantly our translational velocities over the ground. It's uh, quite important not to stub your toe during the final phases of a touchdown. And once, uh, once settled on the surface, the, the dust cleared immediately, and we had an excellent view of the area surrounding the limb. This is the view out the left window. It shows uh, a cratered surface uh, pockmarked with craters uh, up to 15, 20, 30 feet and many smaller craters down to a uh, diameter of one foot and of course the surface was very fine-grained. We could tell that from uh, from our view out the window but there were a surprisingly large number of rocks of all sizes. This is the view out the right window up close to the horizon, you see uh, a boulder field that was probably uh, deposited by some of the uh, impacts in the craters that were behind us. You see, uh, most of the craters have rounded edges. However, there is a variation in the, uh, in the age of these, as we can tell by the sharpness of the edge of the crater. The uh, general color of the terrain looking down sun was a very light tannish color. Uh, this blended as we looked more across sun to a uh, uh, more sharper, well-defined features and more of a gray color. Uh, during the initial time period after touchdown, uh, we went through various uh, sequences to prepare us for immediate abort or liftoff if we found that that was necessary. We had 
found we had to uh, vent the fuel and oxidizer uh, manifolds a good bit earlier than, than we had thought. Uh, we went through these various checks and prepared for uh, uh, one liftoff that would occur about 21 minutes after the beginning of power descent. The ground gave us a stay during this period. We did not have to uh, make use of that. Uh, they, we then proceeded at that point into our uh, simulated countdown, which consisted of uh, checking our guidance systems uh, we made use of a gravity align feature where the uh, inertial platform of the uh, primary guidance would, would use the gravity vector to determine the local vertical. We would then compare this with the alignments that we had previously. We also made use of the stars through the telescope uh, and aligning a uh, crosshair by rotating the, the field of view until the crosshair superimposed on the star. This would give us the uh, angular measurement of the star within the field of view of the telescope. We'd then determine the distance out by aligning another reticle spiral on this. We went through an averaging technique on board and then uh, fed this information into the computer and this came up with our various alignment checks. Uh, we, this was all in preparation for a uh, possible liftoff that would occur about two hours after touchdown as Mike and Columbia came over for the first revolution. The uh, ground network gave us a stay and uh, we continued briefly through the remainder of this checklist in our simulated countdown and at this point we uh, terminated and powered down many systems on board the spacecraft and uh, went into an, uh, an eat period. A number of, of experts had prior to the flight predicted that a good bit of difficulty might be encountered by people attempting to work on the surface of the moon due to this variety of strange atmospheric and gravitational characteristics that, that would be encountered. It, it was, in fact, in, in our view, preferable both to weightlessness and the Earth's gravity. This led us to believe, this in conjunction with the fact that all the systems in the limb were, were operating magnificently and we had very few problems, to uh, go ahead with the, with the surface work immediately. Uh, we predicted that we might be ready uh, to leave the limb by 8 o'clock, but those of you who followed on the ground recognize we missed our estimate by a good deal. This was due to a number of factors. Uh, one, we had uh, house cleaning to perform. Uh, food packages, flight plans, and uh, all the items that we'd used in the previous descent to be stowed out of the way and prior to depressurizing the, the lunar module. Uh, it took longer to depressurize the lunar module than we had anticipated, and it also took longer to get the cooling units in our backpacks uh, operating than, than we had expected. In sum and substance, it took us approximately an hour longer to get ready than, 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 we, would, that, than we had predicted. When, uh, when we actually descended the, the ladder, it, found, it was found to be very much like the lunar gravity simulations we had performed here on Earth. And no difficulty was, was encountered in, in descending the ladder. The last step was about three and a half feet from the surface, uh, and uh, we're somewhat concerned that uh, we might have difficulty in, in re-entering the limb at the end of our activity period, so we practiced, uh, practiced that before doing uh, the exercise of bringing the camera down, which took the subsequent surface pictures. Here you see the camera being lowered on what might be called a Brooklyn clothesline. 
I, I was operating quite carefully here because immediately to my right and off the picture was a six foot deep crater and I uh, was somewhat concerned about uh, uh, losing my balance on the steep slopes. The, uh, the other uh, item of interest in the very early stages of EVA, should it, should it have been cut short for some unknown reason, was uh, the, the job of bringing back a sample of the lunar rocks. And these, these photographs show the collection of that initial sample into a small bag, and uh, then that bag being deposited in my uh, pocket. This was the first of a number of times when we found, <laughs> found two men were a great help. I quickly put up the TV camera. And, and then, more leisurely, but Buzz and I joined together to uh, erect the American flag. We found uh, on a number of occasions that we were help, able to help each other in many ways on the surface. Uh, you probably recall the times that I got my foot caught in the television cable and Buzz was able to help me extract it without without falling down. We had uh, some difficulty at first uh, getting the uh, pole of the flag to remain into the surface. Uh, in penetrating the surface, we found that uh, most objects would uh, go down about five, maybe six inches, and then it would meet with a uh, gradual resistance. Uh, at the same time, there was not much of a supporting force on either side, so we had to lean the flag back slightly uh, in order for it to, uh, to maintain this position. So many people have done so much to give us this opportunity to place this American flag on the surface. To me, it was one of the prouder moments of my life to be able to stand there and quickly salute the flag. The rest, the rest of the activity seemed to go very rushed. Uh, there were a lot of things to do, and uh, we had a hard time getting them finished. We did find that uh, Mobility on the surface was, in general, uh, a good bit better than perhaps we uh, had anticipated it. There was a slight tendency to, uh, uh, to be more nearly toward the rear of a neutral, stable position. Uh, balance seemed to be quite easy to identify, and as one would lean one, uh, a slight bit to one side or the other, it was very easy to identify when this uh, loss of balance was approaching. In maneuvering around, as you saw, this was one of my tasks fairly early uh, in the EVA. I found that uh, a standard uh, loping technique of one foot in front of the other uh, worked out quite well, as, as we would have expected. One could also uh, jump in more of a kangaroo fashion, two feet at a time. Uh, this seemed to work, uh, but without quite the same degree of control uh, of your stability as you moved along. We found we had to anticipate three to four steps ahead in comparison with the one or two steps that are ahead uh, when you're walking uh, on the earth. We had very little trouble, uh, much less trouble than expected on the surface. It was a pleasant operation. Temperatures weren't high, they were very comfortable, a little EMU. The the combination of, of spacesuit and backpack that provided or sustained our life on the surface operated magnificently. We had no cause for concern at any time with the operation of that equipment. The, the primary difficulty that we observed was that there was just far too little time to do the myriads of things that we would have liked to have done. 
in the in the pictures we showed earlier, you saw uh, rocks in the boulder field out Buzz's window that were three and four feet uh, in size, very likely uh, pieces of the lunar bedrock. And it would have been very interesting to go over and and uh, get some samples of those. There were other craters that uh, differed widely that uh, that would have been interesting to to examine and photograph. And uh, we had the problem of uh, of the five-year-old boy in a in a candy store. There are just too many interesting things to do. The the surface, as as we said, uh, was, was fine grained with lots of rocks in it. It took footprints very well, and the footprints stayed in place. Uh, the uh, the limb was in, in good shape and uh, it, it exhibited no damage from uh, the landing or the descent. It's a picture of the ladder with the uh, well-known plaque uh, on the primary strut. The, uh, there was a question as to whether the limb would sink in up to its knees. It didn't, as you can see. Uh, the foot pad sunk in perhaps an inch or two. And uh, the probe uh, in this picture was folded over and sticks up through the sand in the bottom right-hand uh, corner, showing, uh, showing that we were indeed traveling slightly sideways at, at touchdown. Uh, there were a wide variety of surfaces. Here, Buzz is standing in a small crater and it gives a very good picture of the, the rounded rims of the, uh, of the, what we believe are, are very old features. Uh, the, the limb was in a relatively smooth area between the craters and the boulder fields. Uh, and we had some difficulty in determining just what uh, straight up and down was. Our ability to pick up straight up and down was probably several degrees less accurate than it is here on Earth, and it caused some, uh, some difficulty in uh, having uh, things like our, our, our cameras uh, and scientific experiments uh, sometimes not maintain the level attitude we expected. The uh, two experiments uh, that you saw in a previous picture uh, were deployed in a scientific equipment bay. Uh, we found that uh, getting them down uh, produced no significant problems. And uh, here you see uh, a view of my carrying these two experiments out to the deployment site about 70 feet to the uh, south of the lunar module. You have a very good view of the uh, varying depths of this uh, upper surface layer. You see that uh, along the crater rim, uh, the small crater rim off to my left, uh, along this the, uh, the upper surface appears to be about uh, two to three inches and the subsurface uh, uh, has a slope that is rather ill-defined and uh, one has to be very careful in, in threading your way around these very uh, small craters. Any long excursions I feel would would take a good bit of attention as you're uh, moving along to avoid uh, walking along uh, or down the slope of some of these smaller craters. This is the uh, passive uh, seismic uh, experiment that was deployed and has been giving us uh, good returns on the uh, uh, interactions of the, uh, of the moon. Uh, we had a uh, little difficulty deploying one of the panels. Uh, I had to move around to the far side and, and uh, release a restraining lever, and uh, then the second panel came out. We had a little bit of difficulty determining, as Neil said, uh, the exact uh, local horizontal. And I think this is due to the uh, decrease in the cues that a person has as to which way uh, up up really is. One has to lean a little bit more off to the side before you get this body cue that, that uh, you're approaching off, uh, off balance. And of course, the, the terrain varied considerably uh, in this area. 
this second experiment is the uh, uh, laser reflector. We've uh, been successful in uh, bouncing laser beams off this. It consists of a hundred uh, arrays of uh, corner reflectors. Uh, it was quite surprising the resistance that was met in this uh, subsurface uh, medium and at the same time you see that it did not support very well the, uh, the core tube as I was driving it into the surface. Uh, this is a close, uh, a double picture. It's actually a stereo picture uh, of, uh, of fine particulate material in, in the moon. This is uh, taken from a glass. And uh, the analysis of uh, the cause for that characteristic is of extreme interest to the scientific community. Second uh, picture taken with that uh, scientific camera shows uh, the nature of, of, uh, of the clods of, of lunar surface material. And this picture shows the 80-foot crater, which uh, I, that you observed earlier in the motion picture footage during the final phases of descent. Uh, we had very much hoped that uh, this, this crater would be deep enough to, uh, to show the, the lunar bedrock. It, it was about 15 or 20 feet deep, and although there are rocks in the bottom, there are no evidences on the inner walls of, of actually uh, uh, getting a, a picture or a, a view of the, the lunar bedrock. We deposited uh, several items on the lunar surface. I'm sure you're aware of these. Uh, one was a disk with uh, 73 messages from nations of the world. There was a patch from Apollo 1 and uh, various uh, metals from the uh, cosmonaut. We also uh, elected as a crew to deposit uh, a symbol which was, which was representative of our patch, that is the U.S. Eagle carrying the olive branch to the lunar surface, and we thought it was appropriate to uh, deposit this replica of the olive branch uh, before we left. This, uh, after re-entering the, the limb, we could see the effects of her in the area where the majority of the walking took place. Uh, however, uh, in the left side of the picture where it is not uh, as dark, there was also a good bit of walking, and so that indicates that uh, the walking probably just uh, in, increases your ability to notice the effects of the strange uh, lighting that Buzz talked about earlier, where the cross sun lighting is a good bit darker than the down, down sun. Following the EVA, we had, the, uh, we had a sleep period, which, in a word, uh, <coughs> didn't go quite as well as we thought it might. Uh, we found it was quite difficult to, uh, to uh, keep warm when we uh, pulled rather difficult for us to sleep. You see uh, mounted in the right hand window, uh, the 16 millimeter camera as it was mounted for uh, taking the pictures on the surface. Uh, following the sleep period as we're approaching the liftoff point, uh, we progressed with a gradual power up of the lunar module, which included another star alignment up in front of the instrument panel that was used to record the uh, various messages that were sent up to us, the, the whole host of numbers for the particular maneuvers that were coming up that we would copy down. We'd log these on, on that sort of a uh, data sheet. This film shows our final look at Tranquility Base uh, before our departure. And the ascent was a great pleasure. It was very smooth. Uh, we were very, very pleased to have that engine light up. <laughs>
Commission uh, gave us a excellent view of the our our uh, takeoff trajectory and tranquility base as we left and at all times through the ascent we could pick up uh, landmarks that assured us that we were on the on the proper track there were uh, no difficulties with the ascent and uh, we uh, we enjoyed the ride more than we could say. Both uh, guidance systems agreed very closely when we were finally inserted into orbit. I believe there was something on the order of a half, half a mile or seven tenths of a mile difference in the apogee uh, in the resulting orbit. Uh, following uh, an alignment check after insertion into orbit, we uh, proceeded with uh, gathering radar data of relative positions between the two vehicles. The uh, solution for the first uh, sequence of rendezvous maneuvers was extremely close and agreed very closely with, uh, with the value that the ground had given us. The uh, surprising uh, feature of this rendezvous, many of us were expecting a fairly large out of plainness due to perhaps some misalignment in azimuth on the surface. We were expecting somewhere up to maybe uh, 20 or 30 feet per second out of plane velocity. Uh, we found that we didn't uh, even have to make use of a particular out of plane maneuver that had been inserted between uh, uh, two other sequential maneuvers. In comparison with uh, many simulator runs, we found that this was uh, about as, as perfect a rendezvous as, as we could have asked for. You've noted some oscillations in this film during ascent, and that's a real characteristic. The the vehicle, due to the changing center gravity as fuel is used, uh, does uh, a good bit of five degree oscillations throughout the ascent. This is Eagle as seen by Columbia, or perhaps half an Eagle would be better since uh, the uh, landing gear and lower part, the descent stage, of course, remained on the surface. This was uh, a, a very happy part of the flight for me. I, uh, for the first time, really felt that uh, we were going to carry the thing off at this stage of the game, and it looked like. Uh, <laughs> Although we were far from home, we were uh, a lot closer to it than, uh, than the pure distance might indicate. Uh, Neil's making the initial maneuvers here to get turned around, and then again I do the final docking. This is somewhat swifter than, uh, than real time. The probe, the, uh, the dark uh, funnel on the top of the limb, and the, uh, the docking target below it and to the left in the uh, lighter portion of the limb. The, uh, as Buzz said, the rendezvous was absolutely beautiful. They came up uh, from below absolutely uh, as if they were riding on rails. There was absolutely no, uh, no disturbance uh, or any uh, off nominal effects during the last part of the rendezvous. Upper uh, right, you can see the, uh, the RCS quads. And uh, down below the various uh, antenna and other protuberances. This gives you some idea of the, uh, the rough terrain available on the moon. Of course, the, the maria on the front side are, uh, are uh, smoother than this, but in general, the, the, the back side of the moon is, uh, is quite rough. And uh, I have, uh, in general, just a series of slides, which in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, dwell on, but I just like to point out that we did take a, a, a number of pictures. I believe from Columbia we took probably uh, a thousand stills, and uh, some of them uh, show very interesting uh, surface features, various uh, types of unusual craters, and uh, uh, some of them pose many riddles, which we hope uh, the geologists will in time uh, be able to answer for us. That line of craters, for example, is uh, is difficult to explain, or at least without an argument, it is. <laughs> a newer crater uh, with the, the white material having come from it. And this is a picture of the, uh, of the solar corona. Neil, would you like to close with that? Uh, during our 
flight to the moon, we flew through the moon shadow. In fact, the moon was eclipsing the sun, and uh, we took the opportunity to try to take some, some photographs of it, but our film was just not sufficiently fast to, uh, to capture the, the event. Uh, however, this does show the brightest part of the solar corona. It extends uh, several moon diameters in addition on each side, uh, roughly parallel to, to that light. But the striking thing to, to us uh, as observers was not the solar corona, but the moon itself. Of course, it was dark, unilluminated by the sun, but it was illuminated by the Earth. And uh, at this relatively close range, it had a uh, decided three-dimensional uh, effect and was undoubtedly one of the most impressive sights uh, of the flight. As we, as we left the moon after uh, a successful TEI, this is the view that we observed. Uh, I think that, uh, at least from where, where I sit here on the stage, the colors uh, that you see there are quite close to being uh, actually representative of the moon as seen from, from that distance. We were uh, sorry to see the moon go, but we were certainly see, glad to see the Earth re return. Uh, we used, uh, uh, took a large number of, of photographs of the Earth on the way out and back and uh, had our wristwatches set on Houston time. Uh, an interesting uh, use can be made of that. Uh, if you were looking at this picture and, uh, and you looked at your watch and your watch said uh, 7 o'clock in the evening, then you'd know that uh, Houston is, is about 7 o'clock from the evening and it's about uh, an hour away from sunset, so uh, it would be about 1 24th of uh, an Earth's circumference away from the, the shadow, which is just about 15 degrees there. So at any time, by looking at a wristwatch and looking down at the Earth, we knew what was underneath the clouds, and it aided us in some ways in picking out what, uh, what we should be seeing. We could see a large number of, uh, uh, of de details on the, on the Earth's surface, uh, certainly all the continents and islands and, and details uh, many of which you followed uh, perhaps in, in our discussions over the, over the radio communications, but it was interesting to us to find out how well we could uh, observe weather patterns on uh, not only the worldwide scale, which you see here, but uh, in uh, specific uh, localities. Uh, this particular shot does show the uh, coast of North America, uh, the equatorial uh, cloud layers, a what we think is probably an intertropical convergence zone, and, and cirrus clouds over the Antarctic. We're ready now for question and answers and wait for the microphone and we'll go right down the line and we'll catch everyone if you'll just be patient. Tom will too. How much time did you have left in your uh, life support backpacks uh, at the time you got back on board LEM? Uh, I haven't seen the post-flight analysis of the numbers. Uh, we had rough of, roughly half of our available oxygen supply remaining in the backpacks and uh, somewhat less uh, percentage uh, in the water supplies, which is used for cooling. Uh, of course, uh, particularly on our first experience with the use of that backpack on the lunar surface, we were interesting, interested in conserving a good bit of margin in case we had difficulty with closing the hatch or repressurizing the lamb or had any difficulties with getting uh, the uh, systems operating again in the normal fashion inside the cockpit. Uh, Colonel Aldrin and Mr. Armstrong, uh, when President Nixon made his phone call to you on the moon, it looked like you, the two of you suddenly stopped doing, any, doing everything and stood there and listened and talked to him. 
It looked there for a moment like you might have been a little bit aware of what was going on. You weren't busy. Was there ever a moment on the moon when either one of you were just a little bit spellbound by what was going on? About two and a half hours. <laughs> I'd like to ask Neil Armstrong when he began to think of what he would say when he put his foot down on the lunar surface and how long he pondered this, this sta the statement about uh, a small step for man, gigantic leap for mankind. Yes, I did uh, think about it. Uh, it, I, it was not extemporaneous, neither was it planned. It evolved during the conduct of the flight, and I decided what the words would be while we were on the lunar, lunar surface just prior to leaving the land. I'd like to ask Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, and I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but when you first stepped on the moon, did it strike you as you were stepping, that you were stepping on uh, a piece of the earth or uh, sort of what your inner feelings were, uh, uh, whether you felt you were standing in a desert or this was really another world, or how you felt at that point? Well, there was no question in our minds where we were. We'd been orbiting around the moon for quite a while. <laughs> at, at the same time... Uh, to ask Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, and I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but when you first stepped on the moon, did it strike you as you were stepping, that you were stepping on uh, a piece of the earth, or uh, sort of what your inner feelings were, uh, uh, whether you felt you were standing in a desert, or this was really another world, or how you felt at that point? Well, there was no question in our minds where we were. we have been orbiting around the moon. At, at the same time, uh, 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 we have experienced uh, 1.6G before. Uh, we've been exposed to some degree to the, uh, the lighting that we saw. Uh, however, this was, in my case, uh, an extremely foreign situation with the uh, stark nature of the uh, light and dark conditions. dark conditions and of course we uh, first set foot on the moon in, in the dark shadowy area. It, uh, it's a, a stark and strangely different place but uh, it looked friendly to me and it proved to be friendly. Some people have criticized the space program as a misplaced item uh, on a list of national priorities. I'd like to ask any of the astronauts, how do you view space exploration as a relative priority compared with the pressing needs of the domestic society and the world community at large? Well, of course, we all recognize that the world is continually faced with a large number of varying kinds of problems. And uh, it's our view that all those problems have to be faced simultaneously. Uh, it's not possible to uh, to neglect any of those areas, and we certainly don't feel that it, it's our place to neglect space exploration. Uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, during the flight, uh, during the decent power descent portion of the flight, uh, about the program alarms and so forth. And I wondered if uh, you all could uh, describe your uh, thoughts on the subject how it went and what uh, advice you might have to offer the crews of Apollo 12 and subsequent flights for this portion of the mission. Well, I, th I think we've, uh, we pretty well understand what, what caused these program alarms. It was uh, the fact that the computer was in the process of uh, solving the landing problem. And at the same time, uh, we had 
the uh, rendezvous radar in a powered up condition and uh, this tended to uh, add an additional burden to the uh, to the computer operation now uh, I don't think that uh, either the ground people uh, or ourselves really anticipated that this would happen uh, it was not a serious program alarm it just told us that for a brief instant the computer was reaching a point of of being uh, over over-programmed or having too many jobs waiting for it to do. You know, a computer continually goes through a wait list of one item after another, and this list was beginning to fill up, and the program alarm came up. Unfortunately, it came at a point uh, when we uh, did not want to be uh, trying to solve these particular problems. We wanted to be able to look out the window to identify the features as they came up so that we would be able to pinpoint just where in the landing ellipse the, the computer was taking us. Buzz was carrying on a rapid-fire conversation with the computer at that point, but I think we really have to give the credit to the control center in this case. They were the people that really came through and helped us and said, continue, which is what we wanted to hear. Uh, gentlemen, you're about to take some tours, and I wonder what your feelings are. Uh, is that perhaps the most difficult part of the mission, or are you looking forward to it? Well, certainly the, the part that we're least prepared to handle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what do you consider the most important piece of advice and recommendation that you will give the Apollo 12 crew before the takeoff for the moon in November, gentlemen? Recom I didn't hear the first part. Well, the recommendations for 12 on which phase? Will be the most important piece of advice oh, or recommendation for the Apollo 12 crew. Uh, I think we can say that overall uh, we wouldn't change the the plan that we used or the plan that they intend to use. Now there are a large number of individual details which we think uh, could stand improvement and we have had the opportunity in the past couple of weeks to go over those details and uh, with with the crew members and various people from from uh, around the program uh, in general, I'd say that we wouldn't recommend any major changes to the, to the plan. Uh, will you recommend any, any changes in procedures for the uh, moonwalking and exploration procedure? And uh, did you find that your suits were mobile enough in view of the changes, or would you recommend further mobility features for them for operation on the moon? Well, one gets used to the type mobility that your suit affords you. And uh, of course, we would like to always have more and more dexterity with, with arms moving and fingers moving. Uh, these things are under study. Uh, of course, the Apollo 12 mission will have two different periods of, of EVA, one early in the mission and then sleep period, and then another EVA uh, following that. Uh, we've in general looked at, at their plans and uh, we talked to them about the duration. We talked to them about a, a brief period at the beginning of their EVA for their uh, familiarization with the, uh, the EVA, the 16G environment. Uh, I, I, I don't think we have any particular uh, recommendations for how, how they should change their mission. It, it is a continuing uh, evolvement of uh, EVA capability and uh, scientific exploration that, that they're undertaking on that flight. I'd like to ask Colonel Aldrin if you'd elaborate a little bit on your comment earlier about having to anticipate where you were going to walk three or four steps in advance as compared to just one or two on Earth. Did you mean that in respect to avoiding craters or uh, deep uh, pits or what? Well. I mean it with respect to the inertia that the body has in moving at this rate of uh, five to six miles an hour that we found to be fairly convenient. Uh, due to the uh, reduced force of gravity, your foot does not come down so often, so you have to anticipate ahead and control your body movement. And since your, your foot is not on the surface for a long period of time, in each step you're not able to bring to bear uh, large changes in your force application which would enable you to slow down. So in general, we found we had to anticipate three or four steps ahead instead of maybe the one or two that, that you do on the surface of the Earth. Uh, 
You're now national heroes, and you've had a couple of weeks uh, in isolation in the LRL to think about that. Do you, what are your initial feelings about being heroes? How do you believe it will change your lives? And do you think that maybe you'll get another chance to go to the moon, or are you going to be too busy being heroes? <laughs> no, I'll probably get an answer to that question. I might have to spend as long preparing as if we had to prepare for Apollo 11. Uh, in, a, in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, uh, we did have very little time for meditation, it turns out. Uh, we were quite busy throughout the time period with uh, the same sorts of things that uh, the crews of past flights have done after their flights. Uh, the debriefing schedules and writing the pilot reports and, and uh, getting all the facts down for, for, for uh, use of, uh, of all the people who will include that in the future flights. Of course. I'm struck uh, from the movies and the still pictures by the difference in the very hostile appearance of the moon when you're orbiting over it or some distance from it and the uh, warmer colors and the relatively, apparently relatively more friendly appearance of it when you're on the surface. I'd like to ask Colonel Collins if he gets that same impression from the pictures and uh, the two of you who were on the moon, what impression you have along those lines. Well, the moon uh, changes character as the uh, angle of sunlight striking its surface changes. At uh, very low sun angles, close to the terminator, or dawn or at dusk, it has the, uh, the harsh uh, forbidding characteristics which uh, you see in a lot of the photographs. On the other hand, when uh, the sun is m more closely uh, overhead, a midday situation, uh, the moon is, uh, takes on more of a, of a brown color, uh, almost a, it becomes uh, almost a, a rosy looking place, uh, a fairly friendly place. So that from, uh, from dawn through uh, midday through dusk, you, you run the, the, the whole gamut of it. It starts off very forbidding, becomes friendly, and uh, then becomes forbidding again as the sun uh, disappears. Neil, did you, were you and Buzz, uh, did you have the feeling you were getting a little low on fuel during the landing? Were you concerned at that point about being low on fuel? And the second part of it, I suppose, for Buzz is, out of your experience, how tough do you think pinpoint precision landings will be on the lunar surface on future flights? Okay, uh, yes, we were concerned about running low on fuel and the range extension that we did to avoid the boulder field and craters uh, we used up significant percentage of our fuel margins and uh, uh, we were uh, quite close to uh, our legal limit. Will be based on your experience? Well, I think it requires some very pinpoint uh, determination of the orbit that the vehicle is in before it begins power descent and this requires extreme care in, uh, in making sure that the ground tracking, because the, the entire descent is based upon the knowledge that the ground has and, and puts into the onboard computer of exactly where the spacecraft is. And this starts several revolutions before and then is, is carried ahead as the computer keeps track of its position. So during sequences like undocking, we have to be extremely careful that we do not disturb this, this knowledge of exactly where it is, because this then relates in the computer bringing the, the LEM down to a different spot than, than uh, everyone thought we were coming into. This is, the, uh, this is what defines the, the error ellipse where we might possibly land having targeted for the center. Now, the ability to be able to uh, control uh, where you are requires that you be able to identify features. And of course, uh, in our particular landing site, this was selected to be as void of significant features as possible to give us as, as smooth a terrain. Now, in any area like this, there are always certain 
identifying features that you can come out, certain patterns of craters. And uh, to the extent that this can be used, uh, if the crew sees that they are not going exactly toward the pre-planned point, they can begin to uh, tell the computer to move to a slightly different landing location. Now this can occur uh, up in the region of five to six thousand feet. Uh, then as, as Neil was, uh, took over control of, uh, of our spacecraft to extend the range to get beyond this, uh, this uh, large crater at West Crater, this again may be required if identification is made in the vicinity of three, four, five hundred feet to be able to maneuver uh, that last in the vicinity of 1,000 to 2,000 feet to make a pinpoint landing. But so much depends on the early trajectory, the ability to then redesignate, and the final manual control. Uh, for Mr. Uh, Armstrong uh, and more on the landing, did at any time you consider an abort while you were getting the alarms and so forth? Well, I... Uh, I think that in simulations, uh, we, we have a large number of failures and we're usually spring-loaded to the abort position. In this case, in the real, real flight, we're spring-loaded to the land position. <laughs> uh, we were certainly going to continue with the descent uh, as long as we could safely do so. And uh, as, soon as, as soon as program alarms, computer alarms manifest themselves, why, you realize that you have a possible abort situation uh, uh, to contend with, but our our procedure throughout throughout a preparation phase was to was to uh, always try to keep going as long as we we could, uh, so that we could bypass these types of problems. The uh, the computer was continuing to issue guidance throughout this time period and was continuing to fly the vehicle down in the same way that it, uh, it was programmed to do. The only thing that was missing during this time period is that we did not have some of the displays on the uh, computer keyboard and we had to make several entries at this time in order to clear up uh, that area. Uh, would the crew consider a moon mission of a similar nature again, or would you prefer to have some other kind of a mission? And secondly, I think this question was asked, but I didn't get the complete answer. How do you propose to restore some normalcy to your private lives in the years ahead? I, I wish I knew the answer to the latter part of your question. <laughs> kind of depends on you. <laughs> But I think the, uh, the landings of the, the type uh, that are presently considered for the next number of flights are appropriate to the conclusions that we reached as a result of, of uh, both our descent work and work on the surface. And I, I, would, I would certainly hope that, uh, that uh, we are able to investigate the, the variety of types of landing sites that they, they hope to, do, to accomplish. I have two brief questions I'd like to ask, if I may. When you were carrying out that incredible moonwalk, did you find that the surface was equally firm anywhere, or were there harder and softer spots that you could detect? And secondly, when you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? And secondly, when you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? The uh, first part of your question, the, the surface did vary in its thickness of penetration. Somewhere uh, in, in rather flat regions, uh, the, the uh, footprint would penetrate perhaps a half an inch or sometimes only a quarter of an inch and gave a very firm response. In other regions near the edges of these craters, uh, we could find that the foot would, would sink down maybe two, three, possibly four inches. And in, in the slope, of course, the uh, various edges of the footprint would, might go on up to six or seven inches, and uh, compacting this material would, would tend to uh, produce a slight sideways motion as it was compacted on the material underneath it. So uh, we feel that uh, you, you cannot always tell just by looking at the terrain what the exact 
resistance will be as your foot sinks into a, a point of firm contact. So one must be quite cautious in, in moving around in this rough terrain. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, uh, what stars we could see. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, uh, what stars we could see. Seeing any. I remember seeing any. I remember seeing any. Neil, you were uh, a little bit concerned, you said, about stubbing your toe uh, at, at the point of landing because the surface was obscured by dust. Do you see any way around that kind of problem for future landings on the moon? Um, Literally. I think the uh, simulations that we have at the present time to uh, enable a pilot to understanding the, the problems of a lunar landing, that is, uh, the simulator and the various uh, uh, lunar landing training facilities uh, and, uh, and trainers that we have will do that job sufficiently well. Uh, above that, I think it's just a matter of uh, pilot experience. This is for Neil Armstrong. You said early in your presentation that Masculine W occurred about three seconds late, giving you the clue that you might land somewhat long. Now, this was before you got to Highgate, so that it had nothing to do with maneuvering to find a suitable place to land. I'm wondering what would have caused this three seconds late. Did it have something to do with the time that you began powered descent, or what? Well, <clears throat> the time that we started powered descent was, was the planned time, but the question is, where are you over the surface of the moon at the time of ignition? And where that point is, is largely determined by a long chain of prior events. Tracking that's taken place several revolutions earlier, the uh, slight maneuvers that have been done in checking out the reaction control systems, the undocking and the ability to station keep accurately without uh, ever flying very far away from where the computer thinks you ought to be at that time. And of course, uh, the uh, little bit of uh, uh, dispersions in the maneuvers, such as the, the DOI burn on the backside of the moon that, that uh, were not quite properly uh, measured by, by the guidance system. Now, each of those things uh, will accumulate into uh, an effect, an error, uh, a position error at ignition. And there is no way of compensating until you get to final phase for, for that error. Uh, based on your own experience in, uh, in space, do you or any of you feel that uh, there will ever be an opportunity for a woman to become an astronaut in our space program? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> I'd like to refer back to something that uh, Neil Armstrong said a while back, that there was so much out there you would like to have done. As it was, you ended up a considerable number of minutes behind schedule. Is that because the schedule was overloaded for the EVA, or can we expect all astronauts, when they reach the moon for the first time, to enjoy themselves and, and spend as much time doing so as you seem to? Uh, we plead guilty to enjoying ourselves. Uh, I, I, as Buzz mentioned earlier, we're recommending that we we start uh, future EVAs with a 15 or 20 minute period to get these kinds of things out of the way. Get used to the uh, surface and what you see, adapt to the 1.6G and maneuvering around. And uh, probably we just included a little more in the early phase uh, than we were actually able to do. Two questions. Where did the weird sounds, including the sirens and whistles, come from during the trans-Earth coast? I believe ground control had asked for an explanation saying it had come from the spacecraft. Secondly, 
I understand, uh, although low angle lighting caused no problem walking around, there was a problem seeing obstacles in time when traveling at high speeds. I understand this might indicate the need for a flying machine rather than a rover for a long distance lunar surface travel. Can you explain this? Um, we're guilty again. We sent the whistles and, <laughs> and bells. <laughs> Uh, we had a little uh, tape recorder, which we used to record our comments during the flight in addition to uh, play music in the lonely hours. Uh, and we thought we'd uh, share that with the people in the control center. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the sun angle is less a, a problem for the for the the things you mentioned and the lunar curvature and, uh, the, and the local roughness. Uh, it seemed to me as though uh, it was like swimming in an ocean with six foot or eight foot swells and waves. In that, in that condition, you never can see very far away from, from where you are. Uh, and this was even exaggerated by the fact that the lunar curvature is, is uh, so much more pronounced. Uh, this is for uh, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, had you planned to take over semi-manual control, or was it only your descent toward the west crater that called you to do that? Now, this, the series of uh, control system configurations that were used during the terminal phase were, in fact, uh, very close to what we would expect to use in the normal case, irrespective of the, the landing area that you found yourself in. Uh, however, we spent more time in the manual phase uh, than, than we would have planned in order to find a suitable la landing area. Uh, many of us and uh, many other people in many places has speculated on the meaning of this first landing on another body in space. Would each of you give us uh, your estimate of what is the meaning of this to all of us? Are you want to try that? After <laughs> you. Well, I, I believe that uh, what this country set out to do was something that was going to be done sooner or later, whether we set a specific goal or not. I believe that uh, from the early space flights, we demonstrated a potential to carry out this type of a mission. And again, it was a question of time until this would be accomplished. I think the <coughs> The relative ease with which we were able to carry out our mission, which of course came after a very efficient and logical sequence of flights, I think that this demonstrated that uh, we were certainly on the right track when we took this commitment to, to go to the moon. I think that uh, what this means is that many other problems perhaps can be solved in the same way by taking a commitment to solve them in a long time fashion. I think that we were timely in accepting this mission of going to the moon. It might be timely at this point to think in many other areas of other missions that could be accomplished. there are near and far term aspects to it. On the near term, I think it's a, a, a technical triumph for this country to have uh, said what it was going to do a number of years ago, and then by golly do it, just like we said we were going to do it. Uh, not just perhaps purely technical, but also uh, a, a triumph for uh, the nation's uh, overall determination, will, economy, uh, 
attention to detail and the thousand and one other factors that went into it. That's short term. I think long term, we find for the first time that, that man has the, the flexibility or the option of uh, either walking this planet or some other planet, be it uh, the moon or Mars or I don't know where. And I'm poorly, poorly equipped to uh, evaluate uh, where that may lead us to. I just see it uh, as a beginning, uh, not just this flight, but in this program, which has really been a very short piece of human history, an instant in history, the entire program. It's uh, a beginning of a new age. Neil, how much descent fuel did you have left when you actually shut down? Um, my own instruments would have indicated uh, uh, less than 30 seconds, probably something of 15 or 20 seconds. I think the analysis of uh, uh, made here on the ground indicates something more than that, probably greater than 30 seconds. 40, 40 or 45. That's, uh, that's a good, that, that sounds like a short time, but uh, it really is uh, quite a lot. Mr. Colonel Collins, uh, you used a rather colorful expression when uh, there seemed to be some problem with docking. Could you tell us precisely what was going on at that time? Were you docked and then... Uh, Oh, uh, the, uh, are you referring to the lunar orbit docking when, uh, after the two vehicles uh, made contact, a, a yaw oscillation developed. Uh, this oscillation covered perhaps 15 degrees in, uh, in yaw over a period of, uh, of one or two seconds and was, was not normal. It was, was not nothing that, uh, that any of us have ex expected. Uh, it was not a serious problem. It was all over in the, uh, in uh, an additional six or eight seconds, uh, the uh, sequence of events is that the two vehicles are held together initially by uh, three uh, capture latches and then a gas bottle, uh, when fired, uh, initiates a retract cycle which allows the two to be uh, more rigidly connected by 12 strong latches around the periphery of the tunnel. Uh, this takes six or eight seconds uh, for this cycle between initial contact and uh, in the, uh, the retract. And it was during this period of time that I did have a yaw oscillation, or we did. Well, Neil and I both took uh, manual corrective action to bring the two vehicles back in line. And while this was going on, uh, the retract cycle was successfully taking place, and uh, the, the latch just fired, and the problem was over. Uh, two questions. Uh, uh, Colonel Aldrin, the uh, uh, pictures taken on the surface, your full uh, portrait. Uh, shows distinct smudges of uh, lunar soil on your knees. Uh, did you fall down on the, on the surface or, or kneel? And then for Mr. Armstrong, uh, during the last few minutes there, uh, before the landing when the uh, program alarms were coming on and et cetera, would you have gone ahead and landed had you not had ground support? To my recollection, uh, my knees did not touch the surface at any particular time. We did not feel that, uh, that we should not do this. We felt that this would be quite a natural thing to do to recover objects from the surface. But at the same time, uh, we felt that we did not want to do this unless it was uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, we found quite early in the EVA that the uh, lunar surface material did tend to adhere uh, considerably to any, any part of the clothing. It uh, would get on the gloves and would stay there. Uh, when you would knock either your foot or your hand against something, uh, you would tend to shed the outer surface of this uh, material, but there remained considerable smudges. Uh, I, I don't know how that got on the knees. Ne neither of us fell down. Uh, we would have con continued uh, the landings so long as the trajectory seemed safe. 
and uh, a landing is possible under these conditions, although with considerably less confidence than you have when you had the information from the ground and in, in the computer in its normal manner being available to you. For Mr. Armstrong and Colonel Aldrin, would you please give us a bit more detail about your feelings, your reactions, your emotions during that last several hundred feet of power descent, especially when you discovered that you were headed for a crater full of boulders and had to change your landing spot? Well, I'd first say that I uh, expected that uh, we would probably have to make uh, some local adjustments to find a suitable landing area. I thought it was highly unlikely that, uh, that we would be so fortunate as to come down in a, in a very smooth er area, and we planned on doing that. Uh, we, as it turned out, of course, we did considerably more maneuvering close to the surface than, than we had planned to do. Uh, and the, the terminal phase was uh, absolutely uh, chock full of my eyes looking out the window and Buzz looking at the uh, computer and information inside the cockpit and feeding that to me. That was uh, a full-time job. My role during the uh, latter three, 300, 200 feet is, is one of relaying as much information that I can that's available inside the cockpit in, in the form of altitude, altitude rate and forward or lateral velocity. And uh, it was my role of relaying this information to Neil so that he could devote most of his attention to uh, looking out. Uh, what I was able to see in terms of the velocities and the altitudes uh, appeared quite similar to the way we had uh, carried out the, uh, the last one or 200 feet in many of our simulations. Uh, we are gonna end here. We would appreciate it very much if you would remain seated so the, the crew could leave. They want to be at the luncheon at one o'clock, just slightly ahead of you. A beginning of a new age. A beginning of a new age. A new age.